Well, Stephen, welcome to the programme. Thank you very much Thank indeed you. for joining us. You've written a remarkable series of books that get inside the faith of some of the, the world figures that mm. we're used to seeing on the TV, but we're not used to finding out about what they actually believe. And I, I guess the, the one that we're most interested in at the moment would be President Obama, and, mm. and you've written a book about, about his faith. So what is his faith? Well, he's a very unusual guy. He is um, on the issue of Jesus. He believes pretty much what an, what an evangelical would believe. He believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for the sins of the world, that God raised him from the dead again, and, and he's asked Jesus to come into his life. From that point on, though, he's a theological liberal. Uh, he believes that some, some scripture, anyway, is of human origin. Um, he says, for example, on gay issues, he'd rather lean to the Sermon on the Mount than to Paul's statements on homosexuality in Romans. Um, and when his daughter asked him uh, about the afterlife, saying she didn't want to die, he, he wrote in one of his books, I couldn't assure her about an afterlife. So on the one hand, he's a Christian. I don't think there's any question he's a Christian um, in, in, the, in the broad sense. But theologically, he absolutely is not orthodox, uh, doesn't share some of the major Christian doctrines. And I wrote the book because I believe that as non-traditional as his faith is, he will lead and do what he does in the Oval Office based on that faith, just as much as George W. Bush would, uh, did it on, on the basis of his. So we can't discount or dismiss the impact of his faith on his presidency, on his policies, on his way of leading, um, just because it's not a traditional faith. We, we need to understand it. Because I mean, you mentioned George Bush. Mm -hmm. This is the, the book that, that you wrote, mm -hmm. obviously before Obama. The faith of George Bush is quite different to Obama's. Very different. George W. Bush really is the classic evangelical. I mean, his conversion story even involves Billy Graham. You know, you can't get much more <laughs> evangelical than that. Um, he, he had a born-again experience. He can, he can tell us exactly when it happened. And then he uh, was in a system of Bible studies that helped him embrace Scripture as the absolute Word of God. So he's the classic conservative, Christian, evangelical, born-again, traditional Christian. Uh, in that sense, um, attends a Methodist church, a conservative Methodist church. Um, Barack Obama believes pretty much the same things about the person of Jesus, but then doesn't go with him, doesn't go with George W. Bush on the issue of Scripture and the authority of Scripture and traditional Christian faith and, and doctrine. And so um, that's, that's very much the split in American culture which is interesting. You have the rise of the religious left in America. So, uh, the Pew Forum will tell us that 70% of Americans have a traditional faith, but they believe there are many different versions of that faith, and they believe that, that many faiths lead to God. Well, that's where Barack Obama is. So, the, so what's interesting is that Barack Obama fits the majority of Americans. Uh, those who are not the majority are evangelicals who are traditional, and they align more with George W. Bush. And how that plays out in elections, of course, is determining a lot of our history. It's interesting, isn't it, that, that at that time, you know, the 9-11 crisis and mm -hmm. then Afghanistan and Iraq, that you had two Western leaders, Tony Blair and, and George Bush, who both espoused very strong, very traditional Christian yes. views. Yes, yes. And I think that was critical at the time. Uh, I, I, I frankly think a strong faith basis uh, enhances leadership and enhances what a man or a woman offers to those they serve. And I think we saw that during 9-11. In fact, George W. Bush's finest hour... Um, was in the weeks and months after 9-11, where he drew on his faith, where he talked about calling and destiny, and he really achieved a level of poetry in his speeches that was never present again, believe me, afterwards. Um, and I think Tony Blair, the same thing. I think we were all moved by the statements that were made and the things that were said. Um, and then, of course, I think history will continue to judge how their faith shaped their other policies. For example, how much did the Christianity of George W. Bush, or perhaps Tony Blair, affect their decision to get into Iraq? Do you think I notice that there's there's one point you say about George Bush that he, at the beginning, he couldn't read an auto a teleprompter an auto cue, mm. but by then he actually didn't even need one. I mean, isn't it interesting yeah. that that he developed in that way? It, it is, given the fact, and I say this kindly, that he never really developed into a fine speech maker. I mean, I I'm I obviously am somewhat sympathetic to the Bush administration um, as a conservative and a Christian, but. But George W. Bush's, one of the big, big problems in that administration is there was no one who could sound the certain trumpet. No one could really give a great speech. Not George W. Bush, not Dick Cheney, uh, not the House Majority Leader. They were, none of them were uh, highly articulate men. And um, I think that's the difference with Barack Obama. Barack Obama, whether you agree with him or not, is able to give a moving speech. He's even able to preach in church, you know, as he often does. And so I think that does make a difference because whether we like it or not, in our generation, a great deal of what passes for leadership is about 
the way that you frame and the way you communicate verbally and the speeches and the poetry. Um, and if you cannot do that, you cannot make your case and you cannot mobilize people. And that's what leadership is. Mm. Which brings us rather neatly onto the Pope. Yeah. Um, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, who is in a pretty pretty hard place at the moment with all the accusations mm -hmm. of abuse with, within the Catholic Church. And, and the Church seems to be in many ways imploding because every other, every other Vatican official seems to be able to make statements about things which gets the Pope into, into more call, trouble. Yeah, I, I mean, it, you, you've studied him and what he's like. Mm -hmm. I mean, what can he do? Well, I think they're going to have to get very strict with the pedophile situation. The reality is that pedophilia is a horrible, horrible perversion. And while we might eventually one day figure out a permanent solution in, in terms of fixing the human soul, we simply cannot risk it. And so whether we're talking about a Protestant church, an evangelical church, a Pentecostal church, or the Roman Catholic church, if a clergyman is engaging, engaging in any kind of pedophilia, he should be removed immediately. There are other ways to serve God. He should never serve in the clergy again. And the Roman Catholic Church did not hold that view, quite obviously. They've now spent heading towards a billion dollars, billions in fact, on these lawsuits. And I think that the Pope uh, is a man of high uh, moral sense and a man who wants to do the right thing. But he deferred to his counselors. He did what was traditional at the time. And he was trying to show mercy to the clergy. It's not like they have an excess of Roman Catholic clergy. And so they want to keep every good man they can. Um, but I think now they're understanding the devastation that this is bringing about. Tell me about Guinness. Because <laughs> that, that's the last, that's almost the last word I ever expect to say on, on Shine TV. I imagine you did. Guinness. I imagine you did. You know, it's funny, I'm not a beer drinker, but uh, I uh, really was fascinated with the story of the Guinness Company. I was fascinated with the fact that Arthur Guinness, who founded the Guinness Company in 1759, was deeply influenced by John Wesley, who preached in Dublin, and brought those wonderful Methodist social values, you know, make all the money that you can, but give it to give to the poor, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, make all you can, save all you can, give all you can. And uh, this gave Arthur Guinness um, a sort of a, a, a vision for his company. And so he ended up uh, serving uh, the cause of Christ, not only with the money that he used outside of his company, but the way that he actually ran his company. If you had worked for Guinness in 1928, you would have had round-the-clock medical care, dental care, massage therapy. You would have had reading rooms, athletic societies. Uh, your funeral would have been paid for. Your children's education would have been paid for. Uh, there would have been a loan society to help you build own your own house, which was unheard of at that time. And I thought, this is a company that can model something for a current corporate culture. And so I wanted to tell that story. Leadership is something of a fascination for you, isn't it? I'm absolutely fascinated with leadership. I'm fascinated with the good uh, that a person of vision and character and competence can do. And I'm fascinated with how faith intersects with that, how faith uh, you know, helps them overcome their own foibles and weaknesses, how faith helps them survive their failures, um, how faith gives them a vision, a sense of destiny and calling, and how that then becomes sort of infectious through their life and the lives of other people. And so whether it's Churchill on the one hand or George W. Bush, who is not a Churchill but nevertheless has some attributes as a leader, or Tony Blair, or, or, all of them, I'm fascinated with, with great leadership and I'm fascinated with how faith shapes that. And, and, I, and I want to help to quantify that in some sense and get, a, get an understanding of it uh, so that I can help another generation, you know, be, perhaps rise to their best as leaders. And in fact, you're, you're taking very positive steps towards, towards finding new leaders. Yes, yes. I do a lot of speaking and a lot of teaching and I do a lot of consulting. And, and in fact, I'm here in New Zealand speaking at a, both uh, in some political events and speaking to the gathering of police and speaking at a church conference. And so I'm all about uh, trying to earn urge people to make a positive difference in their society with a combination of faith, character, vision, etc. And that's why I write the books that I do. It's, it's, a, it's an exciting thing for me. Stephen, it's fascinating to meet you. Thank you so much. For Great coming. to be with you. Thank you for the right. privilege.